yeah so hi everyone thank you so much for joining yet another flutter ke vibes in today's session we are really excited to learn type of interview questions that we get to be asked on this um on, on the flutter interviews it's a very interesting topic uh there's a me my soul uh when you go for interviews, unendo unachoma one time and then you just chill. So I'm hoping we're going to like eradicate that maybe in a way and try to learn how we go about these interviews, the type of questions that they ask out here. How do we answer them? Do we even know them? Um, Yeah, so you're welcome and thank you so much for honoring this event. I look forward to learning a lot from all of you. and sharing what I know. So a bit of housekeeping, the plan for vibes, we are always looking forward to learning together. By the way, um, there is this thing that I really like doing. Anytime we do this uh, flutter vibes and we contribute a lot, I'm always learning a lot from all of you guys. And anytime I'm presenting maybe a talk elsewhere in a, another tech community, then I always have like a lot of insights. I always remember things like, for example, the last the last session where we we're doing platform channels and Kevin gave us an example of GOT. Like these are things that are sticking to the brain. So you're able to like articulate yourself and properly give examples to people that are able to like learn from you. So please, by all means, always feel free to share. We are all learning together and it's always nice. Mm. Another thing is feel free to ask any question that you have. Feel free to answer any question. There's no good or bad answer. Just have fun and answer everything. And also be very open to learning. And um, another thing, since we are a whole community, please be respectful. I know my Flutter people are always respectful and that's one thing. That I really like about this community. And um, another thing is don't forget to have a whole lot of fun. Um, just enjoy yourself, like seriously, enjoy yourself on this session. Um, Tabi, I see your back. Please um just say hi and introduce yourself and then we kick it off. Uh hey guys, same name is Kia. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, so I am Tabitha Mutinda. I have been doing Flutter. Uh, I think this is my second year. So I need those Nataka Muni hype up sour. Yeah, I need some answers to some questions. Yeah, I think that's all. And it's nice to meet you all. I think this is my second meet up. Yeah. Nice, nice. You've come to the right place. I'm really excited to see you here and Looking forward to also learning from you. I know you're a badass dev, so you're very much welcome here. I want the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, okay. Sorry, I'm recycling the slides, but uh, moving on. So, we have various uh, flutter questions when we go for interviews. Hey, this thing is not... It's showing the wrong, the wrong slides, but don't worry. Okay, so we have various uh flutter questions anytime we go for an interview. Um, what type of questions that you guys get asked? Um, uh, maybe to begin with, beginner to expert. How how is the experience out there? And does anyone have any questions that they've been asked and they probably fumbled or they were very very well able to answer um for example i'll give a couple of few questions that i got asked in this interview and then and then maybe we can discuss through it number one is um what is flutter why flutter what language uh, is used to write flutter and then after that you go to a bit interesting questions like do you know what solid principles are do you understand uh, what clean architecture is what are the design patterns that are asked in flutter um 
do you what do you understand by async uh, synchronous programming um what is a rendering pipeline um can you explain what widget and element life cycles are tell us more about test what is an analyzer cicd integration with the native platforms and all so from that particular list does anyone here know what uh, solid principles are Maybe yeah I... oh nice cool what's up yeah because solid comes from the acronym uh representing single responsibility the open closed principle list of substitution I've forgotten what the I is, then you have dependency injection. Mm -hmm. But it's, you can almost say like a guide for how general classes should be architectured, architected. Uh, how you organize your code. Mm -hmm. You have concepts like single responsibility just means classes and functions should have one responsibility. Yeah. Uh, let's say you have something whose work is to okay. The normal most of the time examples uh, use shapes, but you can use an actual applicable situation. You don't want something being responsible for creating a class and also sending the class to be to some output like printing and so on. So you normally separate those different functions into their own separate classes or methods and so on. That's an example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do I go through all of them or would someone also, also like to try? You could you could go on all of them. Um, if somebody wants to try, they can probably raise their hand and then we give them like an opportunity to speak. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have the open closed principle, which mm -hmm. means classes, classes should be open for extens extension but closed for modification. Mm -hmm. It's basically you try to make classes in a way that changes don't need to modify the code that's already been written for the classes, but instead you can extend the classes to the new functionalities. So an example is you can have, okay, let me use the example of shapes because those are usually the easier ones. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have a method that tries to find the area of a shape, then inside it, you have something like a switch that does, if it's a rectangle, do length times width. If it's a circle, do this and this. That's the approach that Solid criticizes. Uh, if you want to go with the open closed principle, you will have an abstract class called shape. Then you can have um, different, the different shapes extend that class. Then you have a method that uh, okay, you have the ability to calculate the area on each of those different shapes so that your method for getting the area just takes the shape, then calls the method like get area that's inside that shape. If a new shape is made, you don't need to add another switch case. You just create the class and its method and the function that calls the get area does not need to know how get area is implemented internally. Uh, that would be an example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then for the L, it's called the Liskov substitution principle. Uh, the way it's said is objects of a superclass should be replaceable with objects of its subclasses without breaking the application. It's a similar example to the previous one in that classes that extend some uh, class before it should be able to be replaced without the method being aware of it. That does this by default. 
So for example, since you have a class called shape and uh, it's API, you already have these certain methods that are said. Every class that extends that shape will also have the same kind of uh, methods. So you can, you, it'll be safe to call any of the methods from any of the subclasses and so on in that sense. Um, the I is done, I've completely forgotten what it is about. It's a interface segregation. Ah, yeah. Um, would you like to speak about it? Yeah, absolutely. So on um, the interface segregation, where it basically means it that uh, clients don't have uh, to implement their behavior, they don't need. Like uh, you can create small interface without, with minimal methods from it. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's... Mm -hmm, sorry? Yeah, that tr that's true. That makes sense. That was a bit precise, but I would I would like somebody to like uh probably in mm, give more insight on it. I, I don't know if there's anyone who probably knows more about it. Uh, oh, Kevin, are you aware of that that uh interface segregation in uh principle? Mm. Probably not. Sorry, I'll ask again. So we are talking about the solid principles and we are discussing about the interface segregation principle where we we are saying that uh, you need you don't need you don't have to implement the behavior that you don't necessarily need. This means that you're being given, you only create like small interface with minimal methods. So my question was, um, do you like have more insights on what uh, the interface segregation principle is? But I believe that that was a bit explained. You're asking for a summary of it. Or... Yeah, precisely. Okay. Uh, so interface segregation. The same. Simplify it or just say it. Um, sorry, you're you're breaking a bit. Um, hmm. maybe we can we can just continue to the next. If somebody has more insights on it, you can drop in on the chats. Um, Michael, do you want to to finish up on the last principle? Yeah, sure. I'll just add a little bit on the interface segregation. Mm -hmm. uh, using still the example of a class that implements another class, you may have a situation where the super class has a lot of methods, but the class that depends on it has very requires very few models methods from the super class. So interface segregation just tries to make sure you're only inheriting the things that you need. Not like you don't have a super class having a hundred methods and a class that's inheriting it having 10, 10 methods. It should be able to use everything. Ah, interesting. So you're minimizing uh, the methods that you have, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. So um, on to the next question, the on to the next interview question is what do you understand about 
clean code architecture. So if I may able to put it in in uh, my native words, I think we also had like a session on this, but what I understand about clean code architecture is an architectural pattern that it, that is able to give you that separation of concerns like you don't bombard everything into one place like you've segregated your views that is your presentation layer your call layer um and and different different uh layers are not all on the same on the same file or folder so it gives you that that um easy way to segregate to separate concerns and it also is able it gives you like um a way that you're able to understand your code base properly your code is easily maintainable it's readable uh it's also very easily testable so yes that's that's my understanding of clean code architecture does anyone else have a different way of defining what clean code architecture is I think I agree with you on that. I'll just add the fact that um, the clean code architecture is usually structured is conceptually you have something like a circle with the outer area being the external environment. So things like where you interact with databases or the internet and so on. And as you go deeper, you get to the core, which is where most of the logic that's specific to the app is. Yeah. So it, it gives you like, um, you're able to like basically separate your views, yeah? Yeah. All right, great. Thank you for that. So moving on to the next question is, um, what do you understand about design design patterns? Anybody with an insight? Oh, hi, Jackie Mora. Good to see you. Hey. Great. So since you're here, do you know what design patterns are? And uh, maybe you could give us more insights on it. Okay, so my answer might not be textbook answer because I'm not sure how to explain it, but these are guidelines that have been set. So I know them from a Python background. So they have been set to standardize or give um, sort of best practices on how to write code. Yeah. Great. That, that's, a, that's an amazing answer, actually. Um, does anyone else have another example? of how they understand what design patterns are. All right, Um. okay. Let me try to like articulate it in how I understood it. So picture a moment where you are maybe passionate about something, let's say it's cooking or it's farming or whichever way that you like, for example, Let's say you like farming, yeah? And then you do your plants, you plant your, your things, you maybe prepare the land, um, give fertilizer, maybe water it and something, but then you don't end up getting the desired, the desired output that you want. Maybe you planted like 10, uh, like what? Two seedlings of maize and you're expecting like uh, more than four corns from it. So, you start thinking like why is it that all the time I'm doing this farming I'm not getting what I'm get uh, I should be uh, expecting so this is where you rethink maybe you think maybe the topography of your soil isn't nice or maybe the water you're giving isn't the good water or it doesn't have the correct fertilizer and something so you try to like think um, in a way that when you implement it in a different way, then you're able to get the desired 
output. So it's kind of the same applies to the code. So um, you, you whenever you're working on a particular project, you don't want to keep repeating yourself. Maybe you're writing your methods in a certain way. Then you don't want to keep repeating the same uh, the same or the same mistakes that you're doing therefore ending up with the wrong output then you rethink you try to like restructure everything and how you've written your code base for you to get maybe a different output uh, exactly yeah so hmm. what now i want with that particular example do you guys like understand now what design patterns are Yes. Yeah. Great, great. And then um, one thing uh, as I was checking this thing out is I realized that they're segregated into various uh, uh, aspects like uh, the they have the creational, there is also structural and behavioral design patterns. Um, any more insights on this? Anyone? Let me try to probably ask Sheldon. Wait, we have Alex Mine on the call. Hi, Alex. Hello. Hello. Hey, what's up? Hey, I'm fine. How about you? All good. So we are trying to like understand what design patterns are. Do you have any idea of what they are? Mm, yeah, I think design patterns are opinionated, op opinionated way of writing code so that we can make uh, it more maintainable uh, to other developers and also perhaps for the internal team. And so I think it's much of opinionated way of writing code. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the insight. Okay. So exactly. let's Sorry? So let's move. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I think also my my understanding on uh, design patterns, they're just like uh, it's like a, a template. Let's say maybe you have maybe some problems that you always maybe kind of face when maybe you're writing a certain a project or you're coding something. So. A design pattern would be something like a template that you normally follow uh, to maybe to maybe overcome commonly uh, maybe problems that you always maybe face when you're writing your, your different project. So to me, I see it like a, a template that if, uh, that you should follow when you're doing your projects. Nice. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely correct. And thank you guys for the input on that. Okay, so I concur with Julius. Yes, thank you. Thank you, David. All right. So let's move on to the next question. Yeah. What do you guys understand about uh, asynchronous programming? What is a uh, synchronous programming? Sorry about the noise. Anyone with an insight about it? Um, hello, Candy. Hi. Um, if I can try to describe synchronous programming, I'd put it as um, a way writing mostly functional program um you have to wait for something like data from maybe one function so ideally it's just a way of arranging functions in a way that um the outputs and the inputs that are are coming out of said functions are um easily consumed by other other functions 
So like just uh, the sequential arrangement of such functions and um, the consumption of the output related to that. Great. Um, so in other words, uh, let's say you're trying to like fetch data from an API and you uh, are waiting for it or rather from a network and you're waiting for it to like load. So this is where asynchronous programming come into place. Yeah, I think that's been a good picture. So it's, it's actually like more specific. You are consuming data. You need to wait for that data and in the meantime you have to maybe maybe render something. Then when that data arrives, you still have to process it. So maybe there's a whole nother layer of signature. And that's the also now the processing of the data and now rendering it into features. So yeah. Uh, okay, I think you're breaking a bit, but uh, we were able to like grasp a thing or two from you. Um, thank you for that. Um, hmm. Does hey, anyone? Um, yes. So, like, I don't, I don't have so much experience, but I could probably try and describe it by giving examples. Okay. So, asynchronous programming is basically the opposite of uh, synchronous, and usually, um, you're you're doing something external. And you have to wait for the status so that you can update the UI or something of that sort. So basically, like when you're saving a file, uh, let's say on, on, on the platform or when you're writing data, when you're reading data, you really don't have any control of um, or know the outcome. But uh, that outcome also determines uh, what you render on your UI, right? So let's say you are writing data um, and you don't know whether, uh, let's say, it's finished or uh, it has failed to write the data or it has successfully write the data. What you get from uh, that operation is what you will write on the UI screen. So basically you have to await to get uh, some sort of response before you render on the UI. That's how I would try and describe it using examples. Great, and I think you've explained okay. it properly, yes? Uh, perhaps I can give my own example. Sure. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, so from my end, and say the simplest way to to remember it, if you're in a pinch, um, do you have any MCU funds in, um, on the call? Hello? Yes. Okay, so Jackie says yes. Now, think of a synchronous programming as uh, when Captain America throws his shield. So, more often than not, you'll find that he always seems to know where, where it's going to return to him. Or, okay, Captain America or Thor, I think I prefer Thor better. So when Thor holds out his hand, he always knows that the hammer will come back to him. And in most cases, that means that the fight or whatever how, whatever fighting style he's using has to now be put on hold until the hammer returns. So he has to resort to fists or whatever until the hammer comes back they can do whatever move comes comes next. So in the same way, asynchronous programming is basically like you send out a request, you wait for it. As you're waiting for it, you do something else. So in this case, it could be you show a progress dialog or um, maybe you show an animation or whatever. And then when the, when the result comes back, you're able to receive it and move on to the next step. Synchronous in this case would be like now, basically when Thor has the hammer in his hand and goes about swinging and now uh, hitting the bad guys directly while the hammer is in his hand. I don't know if that makes sense. 
Yes, it does. Uh, thank you for that input. Uh, also, the example is pretty amazing. So I'll probably use it for my next talk. Um, but I hope everybody understood it uh, very well. We also have an input from Nadia. Uh, Nadia says, I think asynchronous programming is, for example, starting a long task, but being able to handle other events while it is still running simultaneously. And then when it's done, do whatever comes next. I think that's precisely uh, what Kevin was trying to say. So as you're awaiting for this particular uh, output that you're waiting, maybe you can uh, implement something like a circular progressive indicator or you have a shima thing that lets, you, lets your user know something is loading. So yeah, thank you guys for that input. Alrighty, so we have another uh, interesting but this one is a bit complex i don't know much about it but i would want to know what you guys understand about rendering pipeline in flutter let's see who reads the docs into details so question um by rendering pipeline do you mean how widgets are rendered on the screen? I I would like to believe so, yes. Okay, I was just asking to clarify. Okay, um, but do you have any insights on what that is? Um, not really, I mean, I have, it's really scattered knowledge i know there's render objects and the render objects are the ones responsible for actually rendering um a widget on the screen and i also know there's a widget tree and an element tree so i have pieces of the puzzle but i don't know exactly how they fit together great uh <laughs> That's why you like explain maybe what you understand by the render objects and the other puzzles. Then maybe we can all collectively try to like um, join the dots. No. Yes. Yes. So. Uh... My understanding is the uh, rendering pipeline. I think these are maybe the steps that maybe Flutter takes to make maybe those pixels to be seen or to be painted on a screen. So maybe there are various uh, stages, maybe the building, how they are laid out, painting, but I don't have like uh, the exact format, but that's my rough understanding. But, Basically uh, how the pixels are painted on the screen. Precisely, yeah. I think that's the one thing that I wanted to point out. Um, yep. Kevin, do you have more insights on this? Okay, so for rendering pipeline, I'd, I'd compare it more like more to like a Lego, a Lego set. So it's basically how Flutter takes um, the code that you've written, so the containers and whatever elements you put together, and then converts them to to now elements that will now appear on the screen. So let's say the container, then you convert it maybe to a different color. And then within that container, maybe you display an image. So all of that is, uh, it's kind of like, I, I'd say kind of like a tree, but now like an inverted tree. So it's growing from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top, depending on how you are visualizing it. Oh, precisely, precisely. Alrighty, um, thank you guys for the input. So let's move on to the next question. Um, what do you understand by widgets uh, 
or element life cycles. Uh, we did this topic last time and we we spoke a lot about the widget life cycles. I hope you guys remember. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if I may put it into my own perspective, first of all, I would say like um everything in, in Flutter is a widget and uh, maybe the best way to like start a conversation with probably someone is to ask them if you are a widget, what widget would you be? Um, yeah, the, the, I would actually want to know if you are a widget, what widgets would you be? Anyway, and um, other than that, so we get to like uh, understand this deeper and try to like get what types of widgets are there. And then once we understand what types of widgets, so far I am fully aware of the stateless widget and the stateful widget. And then we try to like break it down. So what widget has um, a life cycle and what doesn't have a, a life cycle. So for example, on the stateless widget, it, it's a it's a widget whose state does not change once created. For example, you have you have some things like buttons, icons, titles, and etc. So this is used when the UI relies on the information inside the object itself. But then we have the stateless widget, which um, where the, or rather story, the stateful widget whose uh, state changes. Uh, this means it's very dynamic and, um, and, and then you understand all that, yeah? So, if it's a dynamic, then this means it probably has now the life cycles within it. Um, and there are a couple of um, cycles, life cycles within this particular widget. For example, the create state, the init state, the did change dependencies, um, did update widget, um, the deactivate and the dispose. Um, yeah. But but other than these examples, um, I would also want to know how would you go about answering this particular question in an interview? Anyone? Anybody? Uh, was it a bit clear? Okay. Um. All right. So I'll assume that that was a bit clear. So let's move on to the next question. Is uh, do you write test? What do you understand about test, and why are tests important to you? I'll move on. So, yes, I do write tests. They're important. Well, I just say that we have I have some nightmare scenarios due to people not writing tests on various things that I worked on. Mm -hmm. I worked with rather, and it always comes down to someone believing that there are uh, okay. There, there tends to be this, there's, there's this saying, I think, not really, not really a saying, but it's, I think it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, where the less someone knows about the topic, the more confidence they are to speak about it. So you'll often find, find like with the beginner programmers, they feel like they know everything simply because they've grasped a few concepts. Now, um, because of this, they tend to overlook the importance of testing because they feel like I'm a rock star. I already know what I'm doing. There's no way I could make a mistake. And in such scenarios, you find like maybe just one, maybe one variable changes. So maybe instead of a, instead of a, a what, instead of let's say an amount being saved as an integer, it's saved as a double 
or float value. So because they don't take this into account, maybe the app starts failing and it takes you too much time to figure, figure it out when if they had written tests, this could have been identified even before the code was committed to the repository. So for me, it's kind of like a requirement that every developer has to write tests on whatever aspect of the code they're working on. Unless maybe it's it's color codes, but even color codes, there has to be some way of testing. But generally, all the entire code base has to have some some elements of testing. Great. Uh, thank you for your answer. I, I'm curious about the nightmare that you had on uh, writing tests because I there's a project that I was working on. It was a bit complex, but then there were no tests test cases written on it and you were supposed to like write integration tests because they believed if you write the whole integration test then you're writing tests for the whole application but then it got to a point where I was getting stuck because I couldn't uh, figure out how to go about writing tests to move from the splash screen to allow you to log into the application and then now move to the home screen Okay, for me, the, I usually put more emphasis on the unit tests because that tends to affect the logic of the app. And now for our nightmare scenario, it was, uh, you know how they say that whatever can go wrong can go wrong. So there was a demo the next day and someone like uh, made, committed the code to the repository, published the app on the Play Store and at the time, I was I was too tired, so for me, I retired early. I did not check the work. I, I think I was too trusting at that point, probably because of exhaustion. And the guy assured me. He even sent me the meme. I don't know if you've if you've watched Fast and the Furious, where The Rock and Ludacris go to the car show, and Ludacris just says, "I got that." You know, he's like, "I got this." So that's the meme he sent me when I asked him if he was sure he could handle it. And now you can imagine that scenario where you go to bed sure that everything's going to work. During the demo, the app fails. And you say in this case, the junior is nowhere to be seen. It's just you as the senior who is there. So their failure now becomes your failure by proxy. So you can't really start explaining that, you know, it's this guy who was supposed to have done this, he didn't do it. So yeah, such things. Uh, yeah, I would not want to repeat of the same. Yeah, that, that must be an interesting roller coaster. But yeah, um, I believe tests are pretty important in, in your code basis because then they give you a point where you're able to like know what's failing and what's not failing and um, yeah you're able to like have a comprehensive bit of what to fix um if i may just follow up a bit um kevin can you comment briefly on how you decide on the amount of test coverage for your application So for me, test coverage should be around 80% just to be on the safe side. Oh, so basically test as much as even like the most basic aspects of the application. Yeah, because you'll often find that the, the most basic things that you think it wouldn't, it wouldn't really matter. It's very easy now for someone to come and just make a change because probably like as I said, the junior developers would probably come in and they'd just be like, no one, no one is using this file. Probably I can just make a change. Don't affect anything. And it's those scenarios of it was working or if it works, don't touch it. But now they're like, but I, I want to see maybe what, what I can change so that I can also show that I'm contributing to the project. And then maybe they change something like, uh, like, uh, let's say, let's say now you're using a, 
a date date time plugin. So instead of a Gregorian calendar plugin, maybe they put something else and it affects the entire app. But at the time, when they were changing it, it didn't really seem like it would it would, uh, it would uh, bring any issues in the app. Oh, that actually that actually checks out. I can relate to a lot of that. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so moving on to the next question. By the way, do you guys write tests though? I mean, I would want to see maybe by a show of a, of a reaction from this uh, with a hands up. <laughs> How many people here write tests though? Mm -hmm. uh, nice. I've only seen one. Okay, great. So moving on to the next question. So what is a CICD and uh, how do you integrate it? And what's your take on CICD in your Flutter apps? Also, maybe to add on that question, what CICD pipelines do you guys uh, consider using and maybe why? Um, I think we, we had like this uh, topic a while ago, but what I understand about CICD is basically an automation tool that helps you to probably automatically do your builds if you want to like um, what publish to your Play Store or your stores or to push to your to your GitHub and such, then it's it's an amazing tool however i want like more insights from how you guys understand it and its importance maybe to you and yeah i'd say from my end it's one of the most crucial tools especially if you're working on a solo project mm -hmm. or if you're work mostly if you're working on a solo project because it makes you move faster but also if you're working in a team, because it helps eliminate the chances of human error. And now in most cases you'll find, if, I don't know if any of you have tried publishing an app for, for the Apple App Store. Mm -hmm. So the Apple App Store is, it just gets a bit too tedious if you have to do it manually. Yeah. Because it's like it's um, the number of uh, authentication and signing, the signing steps that you have to go through. It's not like Android where you can pick any computer as long as you have the keys and whatnot. And you can create the APK or app bundle and upload it to the Play Store. With Apple, the MacBook you use has to be linked to your account, and then you have to download the certificates so it's just a tedious process the CICD makes it uh, much easier and yeah saves you a lot of the time for fast link mm -hmm. um, yeah uh, for me the platform I, I tend to use is usually GitHub GitHub Actions and that's mainly because it has a, I'd say, a generous free tier compared to the others I've seen. And something like Circle CI, though it's people like it, I refrain from using Circle CI unless someone else is footing the bill. So if you're ready to foot the bill for me, I'll, I'll use Circle CI, but not in my own personal projects because the bill can sometimes get way out of hand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's nice. Uh, thank you for the input on that. Um, I want to believe that maybe all of you guys understand what CICD is and you practice on it. All right. So the next question, uh, uh, we have like 26 minutes remaining. So the next question that I had, there's also code magic. Oh, yeah, there's also 
called Magic, but it's premium. Interesting. Maybe they need to give us a, a free version for stats. All right. So the next question is, how do you go about integrating native platforms, uh, or maybe on native platforms or even on web uh, using Flutter? And do you even understand what, what that precisely means? So if I may answer this, what I understand about this is whenever you're, sometimes in Flutter, you may want to implement something that's not necessarily available uh, on Flutter's end. I know there are very many options where you could use packages and all. However, there are some features that maybe may require you to go native and you don't know how to go about it. So one way of going through this is perhaps using platform channels. And um, if you're not precisely using platforms channels, there are also other couple of other examples that you can use, which are uh, yeah, platform channels or the pigeon package or the FFI. Um, th that's basically how I understand about integrating with the native platforms. But how do you understand? Oh yeah, G. Jian Jin. Yes, thank, thanks, Alex, for that um, insight. Also, can you like uh, elaborate more about that? Maybe we would want to know what exactly that is and how you go about the native platform. Alex, are you at a position to speak? Um, okay, so if Alex is in such a position, um, did you guys understand how to go about the native platform? Yes, no? Um, I think from a very maybe top level perspective, understanding of the, working with the where the native platforms is made on channels. So there are some there's some data that you can access, you may want to access about the device. That's very um that's mostly accessible in an accurate way from native uh, perspective. So there's there's a good chance that you can find a library. Yeah. Um yeah, but sometimes uh you want something that's more native. And even the library itself would probably be just facing with the native platform. So it's just probably just uh, abstracting that for you. But if you want to go, like an example of the last time I used it was when trying to implement native ads. I think there was a time when Flutter was young there. The only ads that you could implement were the um, interstitial ads and maybe the banner ads. And if you wanted to get like a monitor feel for the um for your ad experience, you had to like um go ahead and write maybe Kotlin code or Java code. Mm -hmm. So that's one way you had to interface with the native um platform. But besides that, I haven't uh, from what I understand it it's mostly done through method channels. So you decide uh, what native functionality you want to access. You write the code for that in that specific uh, language, and then you find a way to interface that with the Flutter code. But that's a very top level perspective for understanding that. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for that, Augustine. So if, if um if I may elaborate maybe a bit more, so I think you've spoken about uh, method channel. Um, so what method channel is? It's a it's a named channel that processes its messages in in mostly a synchronous way, and then it's 
most of the most of the time it's best suited for like a one time task for example when you want to like check the battery level of your device now you want to check the battery level from your iOS device or your or your android device so on the ios bit then that means you, you're going to like write uh swift which is the programming native programming language for ios and if it's on android maybe you could probably write it with kotlin or or java and then there are a couple other like the event channel which is a named channel that processes its messages using stream and then this is mostly suited for tasks that need frequent uh, updates for example listening to a device's motion sensor and and some examples of of uh, native things that you would want to to access from your device from your native de devices of maybe things like geolocation or alarm or notification sounds you know camera checking battery level. Some of these you can actually access using packages. However, it, using packages and, uh, and and we had this session last last time where we advised that in as much as it's good to go to write the native side, sometimes it can be a bit cumbersome because now you're writing a whole lot of things. Yeah, and, and we also have different ways Maybe you don't you're not fully familiar with writing these uh native uh native languages, then you can utilize packages like the pigeon package. So how this works is it's a code generation tool which uh, generates all code needed for uh communication between that and the native platform in a type safe and easy and efficient way. So yeah, this is something you can go check it out and probably learn more about. Um, hmm. Moving on to the next question. This is a very interesting question. So what is state management and what state management tools do you prefer? Okay, maybe I should ask Jack Zero. Hi, Jack Zero. What state management tools do you prefer working with? Guys, what is state management? <laughs> I think all of you know this. Okay, uh, I think that management is managing the global and the UI or the remote state within the application or the widget tree. Mm -hmm. So that is various state management uh, ways, such as using the other maybe. So we mostly use provider for state management because it's lightweight and also it's easier. Great. Um, and uh, there are also a couple of other state management. Uh, oh, you, you you were calling me and uh, I I was cooking. <laughs> okay, so um, when it comes to state management, uh, I also prefer provider, but um, I've also worked with block. And uh, even a couple of people have, uh, have, have come to me to help them try to uh, debug a few things. So, um, another another prov another state management tool that I, I I actually would have want to work with is Riverpod, but my number one is provider, and then a block will also follow. I think. Um, I, there was a job that I I was to I, I could have banged it, but because I wasn't familiar with the Riverport, uh, I had to I had to not uh, proceed with the interview. So I understand there are people who are particular with the with the state management tool uh, technique that you want to use. 
So, like there is Redux and then I think Redux. Those ones I don't I haven't worked with them, but the one that I worked with and uh, I trust it was uh, GetX. At some point, um, I didn't like the way it was behaving with me. Like when the project was getting complex, uh, it, it would um, it, it it has this tendency of removing items from the dependency engine. So, but uh, I know I'm comfortable with either block or provider. Great. Uh, thank you for the input. Maybe for the next session, we should probably try to understand the state management uh, tools and and know why they are probably very important and yeah, and know how to apply them. So I think I've uh, exhausted most of my most of the questions that I had from interview various interviews. Uh, however, I would like to hear from your end. Do you guys are there any questions that maybe I didn't ask that you are asked and uh, you are trying to like understand or answer? I was once asked what is the latest version of Flutter. <laughs> Interesting. How long ago was that? That was last year. That's an interesting question. And how often do you also upgrade your Flutter SDK? Like immediately after a new version is out, unstable, or you give it time? Every day, I have a command that I run every time I turn on my computer. So, so like, um, because sometimes they might, there's a, there's a time they upgraded to Flutter, what, Flutter, is it 10? And then there were some issues and then they upgraded to 10.5, yeah? Um, did you ever encounter any problems while maybe doing your updates? Um, not yet. I think uh, I'm to speak. Yeah, I speak. I think a uh, general like rule of thumb is it's very subjective, but it's just like if you have like major update communication, so that you can be a feature that has to be um, if you update the framework today, there's a non-zero chance that is going to break something that you'll have to resolve for your deadline. So that if you have something type and sensitive, it's much more maybe convenient for you if you just make your update and then update the framework and then deal with whatever comes with that. Um okay. Interesting. Yeah, personally, yeah. Um, I I don't I don't recommend somebody updating to the latest version of Flutter. Like uh, you just hear that the, you just find that there's a new update and then you rush to update. Um, it is catastrophic and um, fixing whatever breakages that you'll be having it can take time. Me I have two versions of Flutter. Like right now. Of course, the project that I'm working in, it's uh, it's using the latest version. That is 3.10.6, but uh, I still have 3.7 also that I use for other projects. So that one I'm using the latest version because it's a project that I was tasked to start from scratch. But if it's, a, if it's an old project, uh, you might need to investigate and see if uh, all the packages that are already there are compatible with that version. That way is a kina is a kuramba. So uh, a follow up question. So you have two Flutter versions. Do you con do you use the FVM that the Flutter version manager or you have installed two SDK? Um, be before I discovered FVM, I used to. I I I used to have the two SDKs in a, in a directory somewhere, so it's just to to change the name of the directory and then it becomes the the active SDK. Then I just reload the IDE. 
but right now I just use a VM to do that. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. Um, Another possible approach mm -hmm. for Jack, at least, yeah, I understand your your apprehension about rushing to update, but for me, I just feel like for my personal computer it helps to be comes to deploying on my ci cd pipeline the version that i'll start with that's what will be saved on the configuration for the cd cd ci cd pipeline so until maybe i'm sure that the app will work with the new version of Flutter, that's when i can update that version but i i just i just like to be up to date on the bleeding edge so if i find an issue I mean, it also, I, I kind of feel like it's good to find issues. So it, I, I don't like this idea that we always we always wait to be told what the issues are. Because like, if if I was to tell you that there was a time when maybe uh, Flutter was having issues accessing uh, external memory, most people would be like, I never even knew that was an issue that existed. Or maybe they've not, they've not even seen uh, the catastrophes that can come about from it. So call me crazy, but I just like living on the, I like taking risks. Interesting. I think that's an interesting. Uh, so I take, I, even, even the Android Studio version that I'm using, it keeps showing me to update and uh, I, I'm not quick to update. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I, I always well, wait yeah. for things to before I can I can update with them. Oh, how are you an enemy of progress? <laughs> interesting, interesting. But I think also, uh, like uh, you said, maybe it's a good thing that you update and then you're the one who opens the issues on the on the frameworks uh, GitHub account, which is nice. So we have another question from Nadia. She, you you were asked name some limitations that you can face with Flutter over native programming. How do you answer this if you've not written any native language? Yeah. Or rather, how did you answer this question? Well, personally, I've never been asked that question in an interview because uh, 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 most of the people who are asking me questions, they were not, they were not so much uh, into Flutter. They were just probably developers. But uh, if I ask that question, I would say is that uh, uh, the limitations that you might have with the Flutter over native programming is that uh, um, there are some behaviors that. Uh, are are uh, are not going to be the same across uh, different platforms. For instance, um, if you write an app that uh, uh, will uh, will probably be running on desktop as well as mobile, and then, for example, let's talk about maybe maximizing or minimizing the window. That's uh, that is something probably you would assume. It will the behavior will be the same on all desktop operating system, but you'll be surprised the way it will behave on on Mac. It be different with the way it will it will behave on Windows or it will the way it behave on Linux. So um, you might be forced sometimes to either you go right you go uh, uh, modify the native code or you modify code based on where it will be running. So that is one thing. And then of course, the, the, the issue whereby you might have to, you might have to uh, uh, sharpen your skills, programming skills in other languages. For example, uh, you might have to sharpen your skills in C++ or Kotlin or Swift. I think that one also can be a challenge if I, uh, you are having a if you, if you are you are fearing those other languages probably like i want i want to assume some people are in flutter but uh, 
are uh, are are having uh, they 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 came to flutter because probably they were running away from writing code in Kotlin or Swift. I want to assume something like that. So that can be a limitation. Oh, interesting. That that's an interesting way of viewing it. Uh huh. Okay. So, oh, perhaps Jackie is saying perhaps that Flutter is relatively new compared to native. Interesting. Um. And then we have the next question, which is, I was asked about the best techniques to improve Flutter app's performance. Flutter app performance questions. Has anyone ever encountered this? How did you answer this, Julia? Or anyone for this matter? How do you improve Flutter app's performance? Hi, so I've not encountered this as a question. Actually, I've never done a Flutter interview, but I have um, written about it in one of my posts. And the three items that I talked about there were using const keywords instead of using um, variables that will be changing over time. So the benefit of having a const keyword is Okay, a constant is because once you have initialized them, they will be immutable. So they will not change even as you're going within the application. So that will limit the number of times that your widget is rebuilding because anytime such a, a widget, which is not a constant will um, be initiated, will be instantiated, the widget will have to rebuild itself. So when you use constants, you will be getting better performance as well as when you have things like list views, you can limit um, between using a list view and instead choose to use a list view builder because the builder will be having what we call lazy loading. So anytime that you are scrolling up, that's when the um, data will be fetched. So instead of fetching everything at one go and displaying it in the case of a list view, and also when you, now look at things like state management. State management introduces other optimization issues. So when you minimize things like, we cannot run away from state management in most modern applications, unfortunately, but we need to minimize the use of the set, set state so that we can minimize how many times your widget will be um, updated. So I think those are some of the things I would have mentioned when it comes to optimization. Great, thank you so much, Jackie, for the inputs. And um, please share with us the blog post that you wrote about it. We would really love to check it out. Um, also, Jack Sira has shared a tip, tip and tricks for your Flutter app performance. So I think it's an amazing article as well. So check it out. And thank you guys for 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 the inputs on that. That was pretty amazing. Great, great. Um, and also thank you for mentioning about minimizing the state, the set state, uh, while you're writing your Flutter application, uh, and and uh, getting to state management. Alrighty. So I don't think we have more questions. We basically have like what three minutes left for this call to end. However, are there any more questions? And what would you like to see us hosting? The guys who are doing the open source project should also talk about it. Yes, please. If you're doing your open source project, please, this is an amazing time to speak about it. Mm, tell us more. And also let us know what topics you'd like us to cover for the next vibes. I think he left. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Go ahead. I, I, I think um, one question that doesn't miss, uh, especially now that uh, still um, you might be fine, you might find yourself being recruited where uh, there are no Flutter developers. Probably this question can come. Like, um, what show us uh, your, your, your work? What have you done? Especially if 
they might be interested to see your apps that are live on uh, on on play store or apple store so i see that one it, it happens to be a question that it just comes uh, wherever place you go they just want to see what you've done not 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 show them your github or repos or anything they just want to see if you have an account and you have hosted apps Great, that's a great insight. Yeah, that's a, a super great insight. Um, yeah, are there any more questions? How about we like have a repo doc where people can contribute in adding further interview questions? Yes, I will actually create that repo and then I'll share it on the Flutter on the Flutter Kenya. Um github repository so check out for that also it's going to be open source so you guys can contribute to it as well and answer as many questions as you wish um yeah and all so i think we've come to an end of our event thank you so much guys for sticking around one last two last things that i wanted to share with you is uh Number one, there is, um, let me try sharing my screen. How do you share screen? So there is a, a big conference happening in Prague. It's called the Flutter and Firebase Festival event. It's, it's gonna happen on 26th and 27th of September. I have free tickets for you guys to attend. If anyone is at a position to like get a plane ticket or an accommodation, and an accommodation, then I can try my, no, not I can try, I will give you a free ticket to the event, as well as get you an invitation letter to apply for your visa, if at all you don't have a Schengen visa. Another thing is, we have DroidCon, DroidCon Kenya. Uh, DroidCon Kenya is also happening this year, Call for speakers is still up. Please submit a talk. We need more Flutter talks to be submitted. Um, feel free to like reach out if you need any help in submitting a talk or writing your abstract. I will be very happy to help around that. And also, if you can't come as a speaker, then you can also get yourself a ticket to attend the event. These are these are nice places to to interact with other devs to know what they're working on and also to put yourself out there. People normally recommend you for jobs and such stuff on these platforms. Another thing is if in your company you're hiring, please let us know so that we can try to like advertise it. And uh, yeah, that's it from my end. And I'm really grateful for you guys for sticking around to the end of the session. Um, uh, so, uh, let me interject a bit, I'm sorry. You said there is the, a meeting where, the first meeting? It's in Prague. It's in um, Prague in Czech Republic. I'm not it. thanks very much. Sorry? Uh, I don't know, if, okay, if maybe you can go back to the presentation. Uh, just... Yeah. Uh, 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 great, great, great. Yeah, so instead of you guys, I have been given tickets by the organizers to share with my community. So if you wish to have one, let me know so that I give you the code, you activate it. And also if you want like an invitation letter for you to yeah. uh, a visa, then also let me know so that I can connect you to the right channel. For that. Thank you, Martin. Yes, Thank yes. Thank you very much for that. You are pretty much welcome. Oh, and I'll also be speaking on the event, so it would be nice to see people from the community there. Alrighty, so I believe there are no more questions and uh insights. Thank you guys. Please, quick question, how can I? How can I access previous recordings? 
so we haven't posted these recordings because the person who's handling our YouTube channel hasn't gotten their credential. But um, I'll try to push it so that we have them uh, out there in good time. Um, oh my goodness. Thank you guys for sticking around for four, four more minutes. Uh, I wish to end the call now. And um, happy coding. See you next Wednesday. Let's talk about something else interesting. And I look forward to more contribution. Thank you so much, guys. And have a good one. Uh, if you have more questions, you can always reach out on the group, on the Flutter Kenya group, or on Twitter, you can DM me. My name is Candy J.